Prima Media's Policy Yamtabi Madiba, businesswoman Magda Vyajaska joins me to discuss a book titled My Journey. Your family left communist Poland in 1981 and moved to South Africa in 1982. So can you give us some insights into your life and the transition from Europe to South Africa? Uh, absolutely. So I was born in Poland while it was still part of the Soviet bloc and the communism. So that's, you know, kind of a system where everybody had a little bit, uh, just enough, but not a lot. So, but at the same time, everyone, you know, had access to free education, free, free healthcare provision, and everyone had a job. You know, and we lived in a small apartment, 60 square meters, as did everybody else. So you never actually realized that there was inequality in the world. Um, and, you know, I had a very uh, peaceful, uh, happy childhood uh, until, you know, come late 1970s, early 1980s, where the communist regime basically ran out of money. And when that happened, you know, the most obvious manifestation of that was food shortages. So we were issued with stamps to buy food and the stamps entitled you to say a kilogram of sugar a month which didn't mean that you got a kilogram of sugar a month you just got a postage stamp which said you had a right to buy a kilogram of sugar so uh, you know my parents decided and they went alone about three million eastern europeans left europe uh, during the same period but they decided that we needed to escape now that wasn't an easy thing to do because, again, under communism, you weren't allowed to just uh, come and go as you pleased. You had to get a particular pass, which would enable you to leave the country. You always had to leave a family hostage member behind to make sure you came back. So my parents, through various uh, iterations of an escape, came up with a plan for all of us uh, to leave Poland through two different um, border control checks so that, you know, pre computer age, um, the, the border control did not realize that the entire family has left. And the entire family was obviously my parents, three children. And at the 11th hour, my mother said she isn't leaving without her mother. So my grandmother got tagged on too. Uh, and then we landed up in a refugee camp in Austria, uh, which was uh, the largest refugee center for processing of refugees in Europe at that stage. We stayed in a refugee center for almost eight months uh, while my parents were applying to various countries which accepted immigrants to emigrate. So that's like United States, Australia, New Zealand. Um, and while we were in the refugee camps, uh, posters were put up um, on the walls saying that South African government and South African companies, actually the mining companies mostly, we're looking for trained engineers and medical doctors, lawyers, and so on. Um, and my parents, without knowing anything about South Africa, decided that this was our safest option simply because they would have a job on arrival. And that's how we found ourselves in South Africa. Again, not knowing anything about either the politics of the country, nor the levels of inequality that we face, nor the, the, the kind of enormous problems that have been created by apartheid in South Africa. Uh, so that was quite a shock. Um, so never mind, here we were. Uh, we had no money. My parents literally arrived with $500 in their wallet. Um, we spoke no English whatsoever. Uh, so my parents had to, you know, rebuild their life. We had to rebuild our schooling. We, we also lost a year's worth of schooling while in Austria. So it was quite an adjustment. And you studied actuarial science and then built your business in the financial services sector. So can you tell us what has been your recipe for the success? Uh, so I studied actuarial science not really by, you know, kind of complete choice, uh, my parents didn't have money to pay for university, so I had to find a degree that offered a bursary. And life insurance companies in South Africa were offering bursaries for actuarial science. So I really studied the subject when I had no idea what actuarial science was all about and definitely didn't understand life insurance. But you know, from there, I very quickly, when I, when I started my first job with Southern Life, which, which paid for my bursary, I very quickly realized that this is not the path for me 
too mathematical, too statistical, too boring, uh, required expert knowledge of computers, which I didn't have. Uh, so I kind of looked around and, you know, within Southern Life, I saw one division which had, I mean, it's as shallow as the nicest, plushest offices. And that was the investment division. So again, not knowing what investments were all about, I moved into investments. Um, and that's really how my path in financial services started. Uh, and then, you know, from there, I held a number of positions. I joined uh, Alexander Forbes to set up an investment consulting division for them. Very quickly after that, I joined Coronation Fund Managers, which was a startup then. I think I was employee number 14. And I kind of got involved in every aspect of running the company. From there, I left, set up my own fund of hedge funds company, which lasted for a very short period of time before we were bought out by African Harvest where you know, I became CEO, had to rebuild, rebuild a company in liquidation and turned it around in three years, and then obviously started Signia. Um, so, so you know, when I talk about success, there are so many aspects that go into achievement and being able to say you, know, you, you are a success. And obviously, they are the obvious, um, having a good education and solid education. Absolutely. Two, hard work irreplaceable, irrespective of anything else. Hard work is just the key component of uh, what you have to do. Then, you know, you do need one to surround yourself with people who can help you and assist you. And you need to learn how to delegate. You can't do everything yourself. Um, and, you know, kind of the fourth one is being able to take risk. Uh, because that's really what it is about. When I changed from, for instance, working at Alexander Forbes to Coronation, I took a two-thirds cut in my salary in exchange of a promise of a bonus if I performed. So, you know, I kind of took a risk on myself. Uh, when we started a fund of hedge funds company and then a Signia afterwards, we actually had no capital funding us. We had to take a mortgage bond on a house and didn't pay ourselves salaries for a number of years. Uh, so, so you really have to be prepared to take risk. And then the fifth one is luck. You know, as much as uh, you can talk about working hard, lots of people work hard. Uh, there has to be a healthy dose of luck that kind of appears out of nowhere. You have to have been in the right place at the right time with the right idea. And I think that really is what happened to us. It's this, you know, amalgam and, and to me, this amalgamation of all these factors that uh, have led me to where I am today. And please share with us how you survived verbal abuse in boardrooms to empower yourself with what you call your attack technique. Um, you know, so, so obviously as a woman in financial services industry, but I think, you know, it's probably applicable to women in, in many industries, you obviously face many more challenges than a man does. And, you know, some of those challenges um, are a function of how certain men, not every man, certain men react to powerful women or successful women or vocal women. A part, and part of it is how you organize your life to enable yourself to be successful in a work environment. So, you know, starting with the second point, uh, you know, when I look at a typical man, typical man has, it's fairly, fairly easy, you know, their, their lives are fairly linear as are their days. They wake up in the morning, they expect their shirts to be ironed, breakfast on the table, they go to work, they can focus 100% of the time on work. Uh, then they come home and expect dinner to be ready and children to be taken care of. You know, woman's life is very different. You know, we are expected to make the breakfast, to iron the shirts, to make sure the house is clean, to do the grocery shopping, to take children to medical appointments, uh, to attend all the school functions, uh, fit, you know, book the plumber, uh, cook the dinner or make sure the dinner is ready. And in the midst of all of that, we are still supposed to work and have a career. So, so the first part was, you know, I had to find a balancing act between what I did in my personal life uh, to enable myself to, to dedicate myself to work. So, so there were lots of compromises that, that you know, I had to make. Uh, but then, you know, once I was in the boardroom and I could dedicate 100% of my time to the boardroom, I had to develop techniques 
and some of them are mental techniques for how to deal with um, the type of aggression that one, that one typically faces in the boardroom. And it's not necessarily just aggression against women. It's also the difference between how men behave and women behave in the workplace. You know, men are typically a lot more self-confident, self-verbalizing and aggressive. So, you know, one of the techniques that I developed, which has worked incredibly well for me, and it's, it's one of these like, life skills that is actually very easy to implement. Whenever I sit uh, in a boardroom, I would imagine myself sitting in a perspex box. And the words that were thrown around, whether they were thrown at me or around me, would be almost like, uh, you know, rain splattering onto a window and you can just see it dribbling down the glass which basically meant that if i could visualize myself in that perspex box it meant that nothing that was said to me could affect me emotionally and i think that's the most difficult thing that women struggle with not to respond emotionally to what they face in a boardroom and you know the the fact that i could almost dissociate myself from the boardroom situation meant that I could sit there calmly, think calmly, uh, respond calmly, and never be, be affected by, you know, what is said. So, so that was, that's probably the one life skill that I would like to pass on to every woman out there. Imagine yourself in a perspex box. And you became well known as an anti-corruption campaigner in South Africa. So what inspired you to take this path? So, so the number of a number of things, you know, one is perhaps my background, which, you know, I still fondly remember, very fondly remember my childhood and this concept of everyone had enough, you know, which you can't say about South Africa, obviously. Um, secondly, you know, when we arrived in South Africa as refugees with nothing, South Africans actually embraced us. You know, there was no discrimination. There was no craziness. And, you know, I kind of have this very strong sense of one trying to give back. So, so I derive a great sense of self-validation by giving back. Now, what is my skill set? My skill set is the ability to analyze um, the economy, analyze investments, um, analyze companies. So it was very easy for me. To, well, not, you know, not very easy, but easy enough to uh, when Jacob Zuma was in power to see how the economy was spiraling downwards, how people were getting poorer and poorer. And that obviously got me involved in looking at reasons. And that's when I encountered everything from corporate fraud. So if I think about Net One, the company that was uh, interested with distribution of social grants to the poorest of the poor and meanwhile, you know, lend them money at 250% interest rates, uh, to then looking at how Zuma's administration was stripping uh, state-owned enterprises of resources, to then encountering the Gupta family and all the emails which testified to the level of corruption that, that has happened. You know, all these things meant that I had to speak out. And then the advantage I had over almost anybody else in South Africa was that um, I had my own platform. So I was not an employee. You know, I owned my own company. I had no government contracts because I turned down all the opportunities to pay bribes <laughs> in my career. I never paid a bribe. Um, and I was not really an employee. So if you actually think about a typical CEO, a CEO is appointed by a board of directors on a salary with a bonus and share options. The mandate is to grow the company. The mandate is not to become an activist and speak against the government. I didn't have those restraints. So kind of combine my background, combine my kind of deep sense of wanting to give something back uh, to people who have been so supportive and such a big function of my success. And the fact that I had a platform, I became better known in the financial services industry. You know, it was a per perfect recipe for me being able to become an activist. And Magda, talking about speaking out, 
in late April 2017, you were driven out of South Africa and went to Maldives with your family, fearing for your safety during the Gupta leaks. So can you tell us more on how you placed yourself in a position after speaking out against our former president, Jacob Zuma? Um, so, you know, I was uh, approached uh, by, you know, kind of a whistleblower, uh, or at least some journalists representing a whistleblower, who claimed to be in a possession of a trove of information uh, relating to the corruption of, in particular, the Gupta family. And uh, he needed money for safe passage out of South Africa. So he was in fear of his life. And, you know, the situation was as dangerous from his perspective as, you know, he, he wanted to leave South Africa within two weeks. Um, you know, and once I kind of satisfied myself that he was completely legitimate, uh, I paid him the money and, you know, in, in my mind, he's left South Africa. I then, together with, with a bunch of journalists, we were in possession of, you know, this trove of information. Um, but the journalistic um, interests in this were very clear. You know, they wanted to publish articles slowly, release one article at a time. And at the same time, you know, I looked at South Africa and I said to them, guys, South Africa is burning. The economy is spiraling downwards. There's no time to sit somewhere overseas and slowly release articles. But, you know, they disagreed and they went on their way. I had my copy and, you know, I didn't know what I was going to do with it until someone found me in a very senior position in government and said to me, look, Magda, there are rumors around Johannesburg that this trove of information exists and, um, you know, it's, it's going to be only a couple of days before the Guptas know who is in possession of that information. So suddenly realizing that potentially everyone is at risk, you know, absolutely everyone who is, has access to this. I obviously sought the best legal advice I could buy. And the advice was get yourself out of the country and your family out of the country as quickly as possible uh, because you're not safe in any way. Um, and then release the information because the moment the information is out there, everyone is safe. Um, and that is how, you know, in the middle of the night, uh, not really middle of the night, in the evening, next day, we left South Africa. And then I actually traveled to London. And in London, I had lofty ideas of releasing the information on WikiLeaks. That didn't really work. The technology is terrible. I traveled into Sweden to see the journalists involved in Panama Papers to see if they could help me. They said it's too much work. And eventually, you know, I met with a lawyer who uh, is involved in an organization supporting whistleblowers in Africa, in Paris, William Boudin. And he also told me, just release this information as quickly as possible. So I locked myself up in a hotel room for, I think, seven days. I went through all the information, classified into folders in terms of relevance, so Transnet, Estina, um, Danel, ESCOM. And I made multiple, multiple copies of that information. And, you know, I actually identified every senior figure I could think of in South Africa, be it in, you know, mostly in government sectors, trade union sectors. And I sent off these drives with the information anonymously to absolutely everybody. And, you know, the idea was that my, never, my name actually never comes up. In fact, when I engaged with the whistleblower and his lawyer, I paid the lawyer retainer to make sure my name never surfaces in this. But unfortunately, he broke privilege and started speaking about my name. Uh, so, you know, I said, I, I might as well come out with my side of the story. And do you think enough has been done in the country to protect the whistleblowers? Well, you know, given what we have seen with, you know, some of the killings that have happened, the truth is no. Um, simply because very little protection is offered to whistleblowers. And, you know, I've done subsequently to obviously the Gupta leaks, I've been involved with a number of whistleblowers. The most famous one being Bianca Goodson, who worked for Trillion. And uh, she came to me via uh, William Boudon, who found me one evening and said, you know, we have a whistleblower. She's about to reveal the fact that she's in possession of all this information from Trillion, which again talks to Gupta corruption. 
Um, and you know, that information is about to become public tomorrow. She's got no protection. She is, you know, completely scared. And I met with her and she was petrified. Um, and I thought again, the government was not there to support her. There was no one to support her. And remember, a lot of those whistleblowers were, became whistleblowers under Zuma. So there was actually no one to turn to. It's different now. You know, it's different even with Zondo Commission, where, you know, structures have been put in place. You know that, you know, state uh, surveillance is not going to do anything to you. Whereas, you know, under Zuma, I was placed under illegal state surveillance. So I was followed, my phones were tapped. So, you know, with, with someone like Bianca at that stage, I thought, you know, the only way to protect her life potentially is to make her name public. So I found every radio station I could think of and said, you know, Bianca Goodson is, every journalist who owed me a favor, Bianca Goodson, national hero, whistleblower. And I thought by making her, you know, name public, I could protect her because it's so much more difficult to kill someone who is you know, well now. But having said that, you know, and given what has happened even post Zondo with number of people losing their lives, clearly not enough is being done, if anything. So when I look at whistleblowers, those are the people who are true heroes of South Africa because they put their families at risk, themselves at risk for no financial reward whatsoever. Uh, so no. <laughs> And lastly, Magda, what are you hope people take away after reading your book? Um, so, you know, when I wrote my, uh, my book and I was kind of persuaded to do so by Penguin Random House, I take away all the sensationalist stuff. Um, you know, I wrote the book really with a number of audiences in mind. One is young women and men, for that matter, entering the workforce and wanting to be successful. And I thought, let me describe what it really takes or at least what it took from my side to become successful you know and hopefully there are tips there in terms of how to how to behave what to do to empower yourself in a workplace so that's one audience you know the second audience is perversely men so you know in my life i've worked with amazing men the bulk of people i have worked with are completely, deeply empathetic, deeply understanding. They understand the differences between men and women. Um, you know, there is this whole lot of men, though, in the middle who are oblivious. They're oblivious to how their actions affect women. And I thought through the book, I could actually speak to those men and say to them, look, women are different to men. They react differently. Um, and, you know, if, if through that book, I've managed to at least and nudge them in the right direction. Hopefully I would have, you know, uh, achieved something. And then this group of men who, you know, are male misogynists, you know, I actually don't bother with that because I'll never change those opinions. And so, so it's talking to, to the men in the middle. And then my third audience is entrepreneurs. You know, we badly need entrepreneurs in South Africa for a variety of reasons. I mean, entrepreneurs really create jobs. We know government isn't creating jobs, so it's going to be up to entrepreneurs. And by describing my journey, uh, I was hoping to show people what it takes to become a successful entrepreneur. Um, and that it's not that easy and it's not that simple, but it is doable. And hopefully I can inspire some people to actually take risks and, you know, possibly, I mean, they don't obviously have to follow my recipe, but hopefully take some of those tips out of the book uh, to help rebuild South Africa. That was Magda Vyajaska speaking to Prima Media's Polity about my journey.